Welcome to the More Podcast with Ava and Najee, where we are manifesting original rich bitch experiences. Each week, we bring you travel reviews, wellness advice, and general millennial musings with a level of refinement. What level? It fucking depends. Hi, Najee. Hey, Ava. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am just splendid, happy day. I don't know what kind of day it is, but it's a day. And we're here together again. It is a splendid, happy day. Because why not? Because why not? Now, what are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about social media wellness. Mm-hmm. which I am so excited about. Mm-hmm. Are you? No, I love it. I mean, social media is a huge part of everyone's world in 2022. And, you know, as wellness connoisseurs that we are both, I think it's definitely worth a discussion. And this is basically your bread and butter. So I'm happy that we get to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. And I'm glad that we're having it. And I hope to have this conversation with many more people because, you know, social media is not going anywhere. And to your point, it is completely embedded in our daily life. And we're only going to be getting more and more ingrained with the digital world as we transition now from social media and web two Mm -hmm. to expanding to web three. And so I think, you know, it's a really important time to take a moment, pause, and for each of us to assess our level of just contentment with social media, you may not love it. Mm -hmm. I, of course, do. I've made a whole career out of it. (laughs) But, you know, if you can at least like it and use it as a helpful tool, I think that's a really great place to be, knowing that we just continue to advance further and further with the digital world. And it's really a great time to almost make peace with Mm -hmm your relationship to social media so that we can continue to evolve into whatever is coming next for all of us. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I feel like social media is a great tool and I think it's amazing, but you know, over the past 15 years or so, uh, it's just gotten to be a little bit of a hassle sometimes as it's become more monetized, as it's become more commercialized, um, and as it's lost some of its kind of like authentic touch. I think a lot of us Mm -hmm. are becoming a little bit more aware of, you know, what is real versus what is produced content. Um, And at this point, (laughs) I almost consider social media, specifically Instagram, a type of micro production. Um, So with that being Mm -hmm. said, it's just like, okay, well, it started off as this platform where you can share and connect with people. Um, And now it's a platform where people are also able to share their art, whether it be, Mm -hmm. you know, a small micro production of a reel or a movie or what have you. It's just sometimes the lines blur between what's real and what is just produced content for purely entertainment purposes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, there have been so many changes. There have been so many evolutions, but you reference a really important point, which is, you know, the initial intent of social media is good. It wasn't initially created as you know, a way to run ads, mm-hmm. right? It started as a place where you could go to feel inspired and connected to people and places and ideas. And, you know, getting back to that core is something that we can all do um, with a few steps that we take to really make sure that we are, you know, we're taking the good and we're leaving everything else that doesn't mm-hmm. serve us. Mm-hmm. And we're really setting boundaries to make sure we're not getting caught up and over obsessed with, you know, a producing a certain type of reel, right? Mm-hmm. Because not everyone is a producer like that, but there are so many elements of this that we can absolutely unpack. But I love that you address, you know, this initial intent. And I think that's still very much there. And I love to remind people that social media is still a helpful tool. Mm -hmm. It is still one of the most powerful tools that we have. You know, if you think about what we can do with it, it's incredible. 
So how can we cut out all this nonsense that's come with, you know, the evolution of these platforms as they get so much more complicated. And as those monetization elements were introduced, like advertising, obviously that changed, you know, the way a lot of people use and experience it. Mm -hmm. However, it doesn't always have to feel like you are in a love hate relationship with social media. It doesn't always have to feel like you are, you know, on stage, just vying for views. Like we don't have to be in that place. And that's something that I'm really, really passionate about helping people with now. Mm. So Ava, how does understanding that initial intent of social media, that kind of pure beginning stages of it, when it was about connecting and sharing, how does that roll into the definition of what social media wellness is? That's a great question. So for me, when I say social media wellness, I quite literally think of it, you know, as a parallel to um, any other area of your life that you'd be, you know, looking for wellness. It's in good health. And the way that we can kind of look for those indicators to say, okay, well, you know, what's my level of social media wellness is thinking about a few key things. The first one of them being, you know, how do you feel? How do you feel after you've spent five, 10 minutes on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, Mm -hmm. you do feel like you're inspired, energized, you've connected with someone, or do you feel like you're triggered, you're pissed off, you're irritated? You know, (laughs) what is that feeling? I think that's first and foremost, the the best level of information we can gather to really determine where we're at. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then from there, I also like to think about, okay, well, do I feel like I've learned something? Do I feel like I've connected with a friend, with a client? Am I using social media as a tool to advance me towards whatever it is I want to use it for? We're not talking just purely business here. This is also something you can look at from a personal lens, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, did I respond to my friend or did I connect with this new person? It's looking at, are you continuing to move towards your goals for using the platforms. Mm -hmm. And with that, do you have goals for using the platforms? You know, what are they? Mm. When's the last time you kind of thought about your intent in a certain platform that can be super helpful as well. And then also it's just feeling that your time spent is really deliberate. So one of my big traps, if you will, personally is like, I just get totally, um, like my mind just kind of blanks. Typically I'll open Instagram for a specific reason. Mm-hmm. I wanted to you know, look something up or respond to a message or reach out to a client yeah. or a friend. However, um, after a few minutes of all of this crazy content <laughs> I'm being shown, I totally forget why the hell I opened it in the first place. <laughs> it's a little bit of overload, isn't it? It is. And that's exactly, you know, social platforms want you to spend time because attention is the currency there. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So when you think about the reels, when you think about newsworthy, sensational type headlines or quotes, it's like, that's exactly the point. People want to grab your attention Mm -hmm. and they want to keep you there. Gotcha. And, you know, even after 12 years of working in social media, like I still, (laughs) I still have these moments too, where I'm like, oh shit, you know, Mm -hmm. what was the point? (laughs) What was I doing? What am I doing? (laughs) 30 minutes later, sometimes an hour later, not going to lie. It's like, oh God. Oh gosh. It's almost like it's shrinking our intention span and just kind of taking our mind elsewhere. But when thinking about social media wellness, it's understanding how you feel about it, how you feel after using Mm -hmm. it, um, what you're getting out of it and the overall intent. Does that kind of summarize Mm -hmm. how we kind of think about what social media wellness is? Yes. And I think specifically it's looking at, you know, generally speaking, say you forget those specific points. It's how do I feel after I'm using Mm -hmm. the platform? How do I feel when I leave? Absolutely. I know sometimes it kind of varies from time to time, I guess, depending on, you know, where you are in life or where you are in your day. Sometimes you feel energized because you saw something funny or you saw something super informative and sometimes it can be a little bit of a trigger to something way back in your past or maybe a deep-seated insecurity um that kind of pops up so it's just like how how do you properly navigate that right it's just like Mm -hmm. does that where is that where like the boundaries come in when actually assessing how you feel after using the platform Yes, that is. And so boundaries, you nailed it. That is, that is the key here to bringing your experience back into balance. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like your social media wellness check is like, 
is a little questionable, which to be fair, I think everyone, everyone probably feels that way. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Then, you know, okay, I need to look at my boundaries and either establish some or, you know, reestablish some boundaries. And that can come in through a lot of different ways. Uh, but I think one of the best um, places to start is actually by looking at the content you consume. So where do those trigger points stem from? Is it specific people? Is it the fact that you're getting your new news through social platforms? Is it um, that you find yourself in a state of comparison because you're looking at you know, celebrities' lives and wondering, you know, mm-hmm. how yours looks so different, mm-hmm. perhaps? Um, is it, you know, people, family members? Is it exes? Like, what it, what are those sources of trigger? And from there actually doing an exercise to really curate your, your audience more specifically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, taking that control back and saying, you know what, it's not personal, but I'm going to need to unfollow or I'm going to need to mute. Like I love using mute on specifically Instagram. Not every, I wish Twitter had a better mute, honestly, but you know, it's really taking care of what you consume because that's, whether or not we realize it, like the content we're consuming consistently really can pull us in all sorts of different moods and directions throughout the day. And um, that can be kind of a bumpy experience depending on what your situation is. Yeah, definitely. I think curating your content is definitely a high quality boundary that everyone should employ. Um, I think sometimes we forget that we can actually curate our experiences on social media based on who we follow and whose content we choose to take in. I know for Mm -hmm. me, sometimes I will follow someone because maybe they created an interesting reel or maybe they took a really great photo, but I'm like consciously thinking like, okay, this is a trial period. Like, Mm. I don't really know how the rest of your content is going to make me feel depending on how I'm feeling that particular day. And I have no problems unfollowing or muting anyone on my list for any time. Like you said, those trigger points can come from a variety of different spaces, whether it be like Mm -hmm. past relationships, family members, strained relationships with close people that are in your life. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's really, really tough. Um, But again, the power is in our hands when it comes to social Um, So we're able to kind of curate what we see on our timeline just to kind of be able to manage exactly how we feel and our experience with social media. So curating that content, top tier advice for creating social media boundaries. (laughs) Top tier. Uh, I love that. I actually like to do it pretty consistently too, because I don't know if you do this, but I'll go in phases of like, I discover a new topic or like a new networking group or a new something. And it's like, I'll go all in on it. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, there is a trial period of like, okay, well now how am I feeling? It's almost like a continuous readjustment. Mm -hmm. And um, it feels really good to just go ahead and like clean out those followers every once in a while. Absolutely. It feels good. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think another thing that I actually took, so um, full disclosure, I have taken your social media wellness, Heart Center Social Media Workshop. I absolutely love it. I would literally suggest it to absolutely anyone. And I think another tip on your um, platform there was maybe creating a list of things that you absolutely love and a list of things Mm. you absolutely don't love on social as far as content. Is that right? Yes. So I'm creating um, a love it or a like it or yes, please. I'm like, love it or leave it. That's our (laughs) segment. I'm like, what do I call this thing? (laughs) That's for later. (laughs) Love it or leave it. Um, so I, I call this just creating like a yes, Mm -hmm. yes, please. And a no, thank you list. And so that's thinking about topically speaking, going back to what are those goals? What do I want to get out of this platform or that platform? And your goals for TikTok could look very different than they look for Twitter, for example, you know, maybe on TikTok, you simply want to just go and be inspired and entertained. Mm -hmm. That's a great place for you. Maybe on Twitter, you want to get the hard news. That's a great place for you. But it's looking at then 
based on your intentions, do the accounts that you're following help ladder up to those intentions? So looking at very specifically, okay, well, if I want to, you know, be entertained, do I want to follow meme accounts or some really cool uh, social creators? Like those would be great sources of content for that goal. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. If you want to use it as more of like a news source, for example, okay, well, then you're following publications and you're not maybe doing as much of the other things. If you want to use it just to catch up with your friends, do that. Mm -hmm. Follow your friends and family. Why not? But it's looking at curating lists of things that you really like, that you want to see, that you know make you feel good, and removing all the things that you don't. Other examples of this could be, uh, for a while, I was on like a, for a while, it was a two-week, I did a two-week detox, food detox at one point. And I just remember at the time I was following like um, all these bakers Oh, and I fun. love baking. Right? <laughs> like I love <laughs> cookies. I know you love cookies too. Oh my I love gosh. cookies. I love cupcakes. Yes. I follow this girl. She's so cool. Joy the baker mm. and like the best content. But for those two weeks on the detox, I'm like, this is not helpful because these foods are not on my plan. And frankly, it's just triggering me. I'm irritated because I can't eat the cupcake and I'm seeing all these beautiful recipes. So it could be something too where it's temporary and you go in and adjust uh, what you're seeing just based on where you're at in the moment too. Right. Totally makes sense. I know for me on my yes list, anything involving dogs, <laughs> <laughs> anything involving the earth and nature and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And surprisingly, I do have, I do follow a bunch of news outlets and push like news outlets are the only push notifications I get on my phone only because I know me personally, I don't get like that deeply invested in news. I just like to know what's going on, you know, yeah. as far as the headlines. Yeah. So I know some people kind of engage with the news differently, but mm-hmm. I just use it to kind of stay informed. And that was actually, um, one of my primary reasons why I like still use social media just to like stay up to date on news, just so I can know what's going on. And if I'm in a room and it comes up, I know a little bit of something about it and that opens the door to learn more. So I don't know. Definitely. News, dogs, food, and nature. All on my yes list. News, dogs, food, and nature. Love that list. My absolutely list. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I don't even know. Like my list changes all the time, but nature, mm-hmm. I would say NASA is one of my favorite nature uh, accounts. Yes, yes, yes. Love NASA. Well, love NASA. Food. I mean, all of the restaurants that I'm missing in Minneapolis right now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Dogs. I don't think I follow animal accounts. News. I do a couple, but I... I, I do most of my news on Twitter, mm-hmm. but I agree with you. I like to have the headline headlines. Yeah. If I was still super active on Twitter, I would use Twitter for most of my news as well. But, uh, you know, it got hacked. And when I realized I was spending 15 hours a week on Twitter, I had to create my own boundary by not <laughs> <laughs> investing as much into that platform. So it is what oh, it is. Oh, <laughs> my God. God, 15 hours a week. Um, It was aggressive. Like when I realized that I was like, I do not need to start another Twitter account. Not yet. Anyway, I need to take a break because Twitter was like my The everything. universe was like unsubscribing you from Twitter they, just so you could have your, your piece back. Yeah. They said, Nashi, you are on timeout. Take a breather. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, enough said. <laughs> Well, that's literally a perfect segue into the next area to look towards boundaries, which is time spent on platforms. Mm -hmm. So how did you know how much time you're spending on Twitter? Well, I think most people know that your iPhone can track your usage and screen time, um, which Mm -hmm. I get notifications on every week. Um, And at one point I did have kind of like the time blocking feature where you can set a certain number of you know minutes or hours spent on each platform or each app and then the uh the phone will tell you hey you know you've reached your daily limit would you like to override 
So I did that for mm-hmm. a very long time. Um, but every time I got that notification about, you know, where my screen time was for the week, I would always check to see, you know, well, what apps were I spending the most time on and how much time was I spending on them? And Twitter was always way ahead. Like week after week, it'd be between 13 to 15 hours a week. And wow, yeah. I mean, Twitter really was my everything, but I feel like 13 to 15 hours a week was a little bit of excessive. And I had other mm-hmm. things I really kind of wanted to spend some of that time doing. So I just decided to take a break from it. Um, and I just now um, put a time block back on Instagram um, mm. just so I can kind of be more cognizant of the time yep. being spent. That's all. That sounds very healthy. And, you know, that's the thing too. It's like, there's no shame when it's like, oh shit, I just realized I've spent 20 hours last week on Twitter. It happens. (laughs) It happens. It happens to all of us Mm -hmm. and the best of us. (laughs) (laughs) It's all about being able to pivot though. (laughs) Pivot and realize when you have a problem. Not that it's a problem necessarily, but it's like, okay, it does this align to my goals and what I'm trying to do. Basically what you said earlier. And I think I realized that maybe it's time to take a break. Yeah. And I think that's so great that you were able to come to that realization and, and set those boundaries. Cause I'm sure, you know, what have you done with those extra 20 hours? I mean, so many things you could go on like five hikes. Yeah, totally. Totally. I can um, sit here and have these conversations with you. If I was still on Twitter, I probably wouldn't have the time. <laughs> If Najee was still on Twitter, there'd be no more pod. <laughs> there's, like, there's no more pod. I'm sorry. But luckily I have that time back to myself. And I think that's just one way of how I'm just trying to kind of manage and regulate my time and my relationship with social media overall. Mm-hmm. What are some of the ways that you kind of like manage your time, especially since social media is basically your bread and butter? Yeah. So I think, you know, my, my relationship with social media has, has been 12 years in the making and it's still honestly something that I'm constantly rebalancing. Mm. And I do give myself a bit of a pass because there are literal elements of my work that require me to be spending a lot of time, you know, what good, what good do I do as like a social media consultant or coach if I, if I wasn't fully immersed in the world of social media. So I think there's a lot of that is almost just giving myself the grace. That's like, why are you beating yourself up over this? You're, you were literally working girl, you know, like there's sometimes I feel that element of guilt where it's like, Oh God, my screen time was so high this week or this or that. It's like, yeah, but you also just, you know, onboarded two new clients and you created four new videos and like, this was all part of your work. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of that for me is just mm, that sort of self-talk around it because I do, I mean, I know firsthand like how, you know, blue light can impact your sleep, how screen time can really wire you, how like all of the negative elements of you know social media or other digital marketing like right. i have absorbed you know right. like 10 times over so i i understand where people are coming from when they feel like they're just in a place where they're fed up with it um so for me it's one giving myself that that self talk around you know don't beat yourself up about it so much because this is your profession um but then i've also had to hold very strong boundaries so I have screen caps on um, the apps that I primarily use personally. And so I, you know, get the notifications too, where I hit an hour each day. And I honestly almost always override those because I'm not done. But to what you mentioned earlier, it brings that awareness. Okay, this is where I'm at for the day. I Mm -hmm. have that awareness of how much time I've spent, which is helpful because awareness helps you make decisions based off what you know. Right. So, um, I set my own screen caps and then I also try to look at my day from a calendar view and mm-hmm. say, 
which moments in my day am I going to be on social? I think, you know, in 2020, <laughs> when everyone was sent home and we're sitting at home and we're sitting online, oh, yes. a lot of those boundaries that people did have at one point, and we actually saw this as an industry, the, the trends in usage in terms of most popular time of day to post, when most people are online, all those rules went completely out the window mm. because it used to be, okay, people check social media first thing in the morning when they wake up. And then, you know, after half day of work, they're on their lunch break. And then when they're commuting or after they get home after dinner, that's the third time of day they pop on. When everyone's world, you know, changed and schedules went out the window, we saw the best time of day to post was anytime between 9 and 7 p.m., mm. 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So it really went wild. And there was data to help us understand that this is a collective experience of really losing those boundaries. So I like to look at my day and say, okay, I don't want to look at social media until lunchtime. Mm. Like for me, I feel like having the mornings free is really spacious. And I do something similar with my communications. So I try not to do, you know, text messages, emails, um, social until I've had my full, very slow, luxurious morning. Cause I find that if I can block everything out until lunchtime, I'm usually pretty creative and pretty quote unquote productive. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm still re redefining for myself as well. Um, but I think that's really helpful for me. And to the, you know, our earlier point of you don't always realize what you're consuming is impacting you. If you can protect that time first thing in the morning, I can guarantee you you're going to feel so much better throughout the day. Mm. Now that is a gem of advice. Um, I don't know if my self-discipline is all the way there yet, but maybe I can start with one or two days a week, no social media mornings, and then build up to, hey, maybe a whole day I can go without it. And I can just spend it outside when it's not 90 degrees outside in the summer. Um, so Absolutely. yeah, I, definitely something to work towards because like we said earlier, people don't really realize the impact that social media can have on your mood. Um, and even mm -hmm. just to have us having that conversation, like right now, I'm like actively replaying like times where maybe my mood has sunk in the morning time just because, or maybe it sunk during a workout just because, you know, I checked mm -hmm. something. So it, it there's definitely a lot of truth and what you shared was definitely a gem. Like, even if we can just do it in small dosages, dosages like whether it be mm -hmm. in the morning time, just have that time to ourselves or just right before bed where we can kind of like collect ourselves and, you know, reflect on our day without the influence of content, right? I think yes. that would definitely be helpful and people could potentially see a really, really large change in their lives. Totally. And to your point, it's like, you don't have to be just like building any habit. This is habit building. This is something that happens gradually over time. It's not going to be perfect right away. But if you want to be a no social in the morning user, like that is absolutely available to you. And so, you know, you can also think about it in other ways. Like I know a lot of people in my community that love to take, um, you know, a Saturday, every Saturday or hell, sometimes two days, mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday offline and just have a weekend, just live, live their lives and that can be a really nice way to kind of reset and come back into the week too mm -hmm. from a whole different energetic perspective. And so it's thinking about what is that time that you want to protect? Maybe, you know, if you're someone who finds yourself scrolling, you know, doom scrolling, as we now have a term for where you just kind of like can't fall asleep, it's like, okay, well, maybe you could start looking at that nighttime and really protecting that nighttime. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're having weird, like I've had like dreams I don't know if I told you this, but like, um, I had a dream one night, like it was so vivid. Basically my dream was that Saweetie was in Minneapolis and she chose me to like tour her around the city 
And I took her to eat at Colita, which is one of my favorite restaurants in Minneapolis. But it was like the level of clarity for this dream. It was hysterical. But like, guess what I consumed right before bed that night? I saw a post from Sweetie. I saw a post from Colita. Boom. There you have it. Wow. So it can influence your dream state too, which is like, of course, you know, when we think about it, but until you have a moment like that, where it's like, <laughs> why am I dreaming about this? Oh, it's because it was the last thing I saw before I went to bed. Oh yeah, definitely. So no social media before bed. That's definitely something I'm going to think about too. Only because you never really, you never really know what you're going to see like right before you go to sleep. <laughs> Cause I don't know, the timeline is just so random. So uh, oh yeah. gosh, I don't. Mm. I mean, Sweetie is amazing. I love Sweetie. That's my love type. Her. That's my type. I love That's Sweetie. That's my type. And I would love to dream <laughs> about her. But you know, some of the other things that I see on my timeline, I might not want to dream about. So thanks right. for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> okay, so we covered boundaries. Now, let's talk about maybe intent and goals around social media and how we kind of like establish that for ourselves. Like mm -hmm. even from a personal perspective, right? We go to mm -hmm. social media for either news or funny stuff and things like that. But I feel like a lot of us don't really understand exactly why we use it. And I kind of want to talk about the importance of like really understanding our why. So for mm -hmm. those who might be listening, who might not really understand their why, Maybe is there like a w easy way to come up with like exactly understanding what we get out of social media and why we go to it so often? Yes, I think having a why is so incredibly important. And I also understand that saying that and knowing myself a couple of years ago, not really having a why about anything, and it can feel frustrating, right? When mm -hmm. you hear someone say, like, well, what, why do I have to have a, like a per greater purpose for this? Um, so I understand both sides. Uh, I think, you know, when we look at it from a personal perspective, we are, you know, we're community-based beings. Connection is so incredibly important. And we know we've learned, we've relied on technology to keep us connected um, as a substitute for when we quite literally could not see our neighbors, we could not see our family, we could not see our friends. And so I think that's a very just clear kind of universal example of the connection that social media can help us foster. And not saying it should be a, a substitute, right? A hundred percent, um, because nothing should ever be a substitute a hundred percent for human connection in person, you know, that is so incredibly important too, mm -hmm. but really using it in those moments where we can't be connected. So the fact that you're in Atlanta and I'm in London and we're recording this podcast, like that's a beautiful thing. I love looking, I love coming back to that perspective. Right. The fact that I could be sitting here and um, discover this beautiful island, you know, in Spain that I've never heard of before based Ooh. off of following a travel company. Like, I love that. It's looking for those moments of information and connection. It's the fact that my 92 year old grandmother's on Instagram and she's like viewing and keeping up with my stories. Like, I love that. Yeah, it's definitely. coming back to those moments of connection and really just that's, if you choose to use social media for nothing other than just personal use, I think connection is and always will be the strongest use case. I'm obsessed with that, first of all. Um, connection is really kind of like the purpose and the point of social media just overall. And it kind of really gets back to that essence of kind of what it was. So, I mean, connection is always going to be a really great point. And basically how you establish those connections and use social media to do it will definitely always going to be the why always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, when we take it from the business perspective um, for those who are solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, service-based business owners, thought leaders, anyone who's chosen to, you know, on top of that personal layer of connection, use social media as a strategic marketing tool I think then the conversation around the why and the purpose and the goals, it gets more intricate. However, 
it should still always tie back to connection mm -hmm. because without connecting to other humans on the other side of the screen, you're not going to have sales without connecting to other humans on the other side of the screen. You're not going to have audience growth, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So connection with other people is always at the core of it. But then when we then layer on business use cases, it's okay. Well, how do I let people know what I do? How do I let people know how I can help them with my business solution? How do I let people know how they can access me to see if we're a good fit to work together in a coaching capacity? It's taking it a step further to developing a few business related goals that align to what you're wanting to achieve in your business, but it should never skip over the fact that in order to have any level of success, you have to be truly authentically connecting to those humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what things like concepts of virality let us forget sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So we talked about, you know, what social media is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we talked about a whole bunch of boundaries to kind of regulate how yeah. we feel about social media, because sometimes we're not always feeling great about it. And we got to know that mm -hmm. for ourselves. And we really talked about connection, the why, the how do we really, really kind of reach across the screen and really, really connect with someone, which is basically the purpose and the essence of what social media is. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about the social media wellness perspective and that whole kind of like circular universe of everything that involves wellness in the social media concept, is there anything else that we're missing? I think it all comes back to just how, how things make you feel. Mm -hmm. So whether we're talking social media wellness, we're talking you know, our hydration routines, whether we're talking our exercise routines, we're talking about getting enough sleep, we're talking about spending time with friends. These are all elements of you know, holistic wellness that can be viewed as, okay, does this make me feel better or worse? And then using that information to, to really pivot and continually adjust and tweak. And so I think, you know, social media is just one other element to our entire state of being um, that we can look at and say, okay, you know, how, how can I improve? How can I feel better about my experience? How can I really use this? And everyone has, you know, everyone's a unique individual. Yeah. So my threshold for content consumption or might be different than yours, et cetera, et cetera. It's looking at individually, like, what do we need? How does this make us feel? How can we adjust to get to our desired state and just really incorporate social media into our lives in a way that it is enjoyable. It's supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be something that like pisses you off or stresses you out, makes you pull your hair out. Like that's not the point. Mm -hmm. And just getting back to that place where we're not in this constant love hate relationship, if you will we feel really good about it because this technology is just going to be layered on top of, right? Yeah. We're just building from here. Metaverse, web three. Oh I mean, gosh. it's not going away. It's only going to, our lives are going to become more, more digital. So it's just, how can we have this piece with where we're at now and then look at where we're heading in the future? Oh, yes. I definitely needed this conversation only because I would just know that at times it definitely felt like a battle for me. And I really kind of just want to <laughs> escape it. Like love-hate relationship, mm -hmm. but like not in a fun way. Like it's like mm -hmm. love because all the dopamines that you get from it, but not really mm -hmm. love for the content or like the connection piece to your point and things like that. So uh, this conversation definitely kind of helped me get back to understanding the why mm -hmm. and the purpose of it all um, and being able to kind of like manage my thoughts and feelings around it as I continue to use these platforms um, for a multitude of reasons. So I mm -hmm. love that. And thank you for doing all the work and the, um, you know, research and everything like that. I mean, as a social media coach, this is kind of like, it's almost your life at this point. So I am yeah. sure you definitely come up with a ton of different ways to kind of manage it over the years. 
out of necessity, honestly. Yeah. You know? And so I'm, I'm so glad that it resonates with you. And I'm so glad that I can then, you know, share what I've learned to help other people have a more enjoyable experience because trust me, if anyone knows, you I know. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're the expert babes. For better or for worse. <laughs> So Ava, if people want to learn more about social media wellness and heart Center social media, where can they find more information? Well, I'm super excited to have just packaged up a new coaching offering. It's all based around this social media wellness session. So this is for anyone who wants to have a healthier relationship to social media. And if you really want guidance and you want to get through this relationship struggle, if you want a little therapy, mm -hmm. that's exactly what this is. We will link the details to it in the show notes, but very high level. It's a 90 minute one-on-one -on -one coaching experience where we will together assess your level of social media wellness. We will walk through all of the auditing, all of the boundary setting together, and you'll leave with a very clear idea plan for you in terms of how you can start to create healthier social media habits. Awesome. Awesome. So that is one-on-one -on -one coaching with Ava Belke, social media extraordinaire, basically a therapist <laughs> for me as well. Link will be in the show notes, but you can also go to themorepod.com and go to our offer section and take advantage of it there as well. And I yes. encourage you all to do it. And special offer for our lovely listeners. Absolutely. Now, with that being said, should we move into a little bit of a love it or leave it moment? Let's do it. I was so excited to speak to love it or leave it earlier in the segment. So, Ooh. So Ava, what are you loving and leaving this week? Okay. So over the weekend on Saturday, I had a YOLO day Ooh. and a YOLO day is essentially a day where you do anything and everything you want to do mm -hmm. with no specific timelines or schedules, mm -hmm. start times or stop times. And it's basically dabbling in freedom, oh. which we don't realize that we don't fully do often. Not at all. So I had a YOLO day. Um, I started by, I'm staying um, in an area called Pimlico. Mm -hmm. But I took a car up to Notting Hill, which is a few miles north, and I got dropped off there and I had breakfast at a little spot. And then I just wandered, um, checked out the market there. I looked at a bunch of different stores. Like I don't shop often, but there's a lot of cute like interior design stores and record shops and vintage shops and just kind of like bop my way down the street, come browsing on, here and there. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> like, come on, bop. Come on, bop, bop down the street. <laughs> and then I walked to a Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. um, my first Whole Foods visit in four weeks. I may have shed a tear of joy. Oh. Um, I really miss Whole Foods. And... I didn't really buy anything special. I think I just went in there to feel something. Okay. And then I walked, like, I just continued. I walked back. I had Italian food for dinner. I ordered the bread. Your gluten-free girl ate the bread. Yes. I ordered the champagne because life is worth celebrating. Mm -hmm. I sat next to the sweetest old woman named Claire. Hey, Claire. She was a total boss. She was a widow with one daughter, no grandkids. Had a flat in London and a flat in Spain. And I was like, mm, yes, we actually, <laughs> we actually ordered the same entree and same dessert. Not, not planned. Twinsies. Twinsies. So I think she has pretty good taste. Um, but it was just fun because I enjoyed wandering and just sort of going where I was called, yellowing, having a day because I frankly don't do that very often. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. I encourage everyone to try it. Awesome. Did you pick up any interesting little doodads um, while you were kind of checking <laughs> oh, out some bop. of the shops? 
on your little bop. Any interesting doodads on your bop <laughs> down the street in Notting Hill? Let's see. No, no doodads on the bop, but photos. Love it. Took some photos. There's actually a color palette that came through. Like everything I was ending up seeing was purple and pink, which are my favorites. Very on brand. Um, so that was, it was very on brand. <laughs> Cute. Okay. So, so I love that. Awesome. I mean, it's always great to kind of like have a day to yourself and just do whatever, see whatever, um, and meet lovely old ladies named Claire. Hey, Claire, if you're listening. <laughs> Oh my God. The chances of that would be absolutely insane. Honestly, you <laughs> never know. You never know. You kept seeing your brand colors, basically our brand colors at this point, everywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, the universe has a way of putting two and two together. That is true. <laughs> I keep, I kept saying to her, I'm like, well, maybe I'll see you at the park. <laughs> she told me she goes for a walk in the park every day. We'll see you at the park, Claire. Very cute. <laughs> Um, and honestly, I want to add one more. Love it. Okay. Today, I feel like I'm having a very Taurus moment. This is my Taurus rising, Taurus moon. Today, I had a piece of banana bread, mm -hmm. and it came with whipped espresso butter, coffee yeah. butter. Wow, I've never heard of that. Me neither. Hmm. But it was so good. Like, have you ever had banana bread, like with a cup of coffee in the morning? Mm -hmm. It was like that, but the coffee was in the butter on the bread. That's some next level shit right there. Wow. <laughs> As a rich bitch banana bread. I know that's right. But I had never heard of that before. And so Espresso I loved butter. that as well. Espresso butter. I know. Mm -hmm. I'm Think intrigued. of like coffee ice cream, you know? The first thing I thought of was that affogato that we had um, yes! in Shoreditch. <laughs> Love an affogato. That's actually the dessert I had at the dinner on Saturday night. Love it. So now I'm going to add espresso butter to my list of things that I absolutely must try. Only because I was getting that affogato feel and now I can't get it out of my head. Espresso uh -oh. butter next on my try list. You got to find somewhere in Atlanta. Uh, I might have to order it from some. I just, I'm just so confused because I've never seen it before. And I'm just like, now how am I going to get it? Now how? Where there's a will, Nashi, there is a way. I believe that too. I should have an update for you in the next couple of weeks. I look forward to it. Thanks. <laughs> On my leave it. Um, I'm tired of being hot and sweaty inside. Ooh, I hate that for you. I hate that for me too. Like you can't tell right now because <laughs> I sound fine, <laughs> but I'm really fucking hot. Ooh. It's like 80 degrees in here. No breeze. Sun beating on my face. Well, you look great. And I'm so impressed with your ability to keep it cool because I would have never guessed that it was that hot on the inside of your flat crazy that is a huge compliment thank you yeah it takes a pro takes a pro <laughs> proud of you <laughs> keeping it cool keeping it cool uh what's on your list for the week um i'm gonna keep it short and sweet i am loving okay. beyonce's new album mm, and all things yes. beyonce um as we all know she has a song called virgo's groove and mm -hmm. um it's probably my favorite song on the album for obvious reasons. So it tracks. Oh, the definitely. Virgo's groove. It's definitely a groove. It's definitely my vibe. And if you didn't know, Beyonce literally is the queen of all Virgos. So, I mean, yes. it is what it is. Um, What's your math on that again? The Beyonce math? Will you do it for me? Sure. So, if Beyonce is a Virgo and mm -hmm. I am a Virgo, then mm -hmm. I am Beyonce. There it is. It's basically A <laughs> squared plus, plus B squared equals C squared for all you people. Equals Najee. Yeah. So basically <laughs> I am Beyonce. Beyonce is yes. the queen of all Virgos. And I mean, she can do no wrong. I can't wait till the tour comes out. Oh, there's going to be a tour, you think? Uh, or is it known facts? Uh, I mean, there has to be a tour. So 
I I don't even know what the I can't compute the question. Well, uh, who have you seen on tour in the last like three years? Dula Pete. Oh, you did see Dula. I did. It was an amazing show. So, um, yeah, she needs. She better go on tour. She knows better. And Beyonce, if you're listening, God willing, we're still waiting for that Formation DVD. Okay. Oh. In the Formation World Tour DVD. I'm tired of you trolling us for it. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. So, Did you pre-order it like four years ago? No, she just never released one. And then she released a shirt on her merch website that says, where is the FWT DVD, Formation World Tour DVD? And I'm like, this bitch is a troll. She thinks she is so funny. Where is the DVD B? Anyway, whatever. Well, if you keep talking to her like that, there's not going to be a tour. Uh, she knows better. I love Beyonce. She's everything. She's my everything. She's always going to be my love it. Um, leaving. I'm leaving everyone who hates Beyonce. The end. Mm. That's it. Do you think there are people that hate Beyonce or do you think they're just people that aren't completely obsessed? Like they're not in the beehive. You know, and I'm totally okay with them not being obsessed, not being in the beehive. The only thing that you're not going to do is deny her talent. She's an mm. amazing singer. Mm -hmm. She's a great performer. You don't even, she doesn't have to be your number one. She doesn't even have to be the best in your eyes. As long as you recognize the talent and the dedication. That's all. Those I who don't, that. I'm leaving them. <laughs> I don't need that negativity in my life. In the dust. But we love everyone. So, yes. <laughs> <sighs> love it. Okay. So, I'm glad to hear that the Virgo track is resonating. It's Virgo approved. So much. Mm -hmm. And I'm part of you don't even have to be a Virgo to love it. Is that your favorite song? Yes, that and of course the legendary Alien Superstar. That's definitely a vibe. Um, those are probably top two right now, but I still deserve to give the album a good two more listens because I've literally only listened to like half of it. No, three quarters of it. Once. Well, <laughs> and you're not one of those psychos that listens on shuffle, right? No. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, because like, obviously the transitions are part of what's making this album yeah. so fantastic. But since you're not on Twitter, I'll fill you in on some of the commentary where <laughs> people are basically like, this is exactly why you shouldn't shuffle an album because orders are intentional, right? And when you have an artist that actually does seamless transitions, it's a vibe. Yeah. I really still can't believe there are people that will listen to an album on first listen on shuffle like i think that's borderline terrorism to me um why is like, shuffle even an option that's what i don't get i don't know like i get it like sometimes you just want to be surprised by what's next but if you're listening <laughs> to an album on the first try on the first listen you definitely need to get the full experience front to back not on shuffle because like you said those transitions matter like artists mm -hmm. they're serious about their shit like seriously yes that's craziness we're also leaving shuffle behind this week mm-hmm mm -hmm. oh well okay well it's been a great week um we had a great discussion and honestly it's time to wrap so Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, rate and review us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and tune in every Wednesday to hear the things that make us more us and discover a thing or two to make you more you. Bye. Bye.